So hello and welcome to our last regular lecture on front-end abstractions, finally. And in the first part of this lecture, I, I want to quickly, uh, similar to the one on back-end abstractions, want to go through uh, a high-level view of what the general concepts are in this area. And, and then based on one particular example, namely uh, Vue.js, I want to go through these concepts and how they're implemented in, in practice. After we go through the theory and, and the case study, basically, I uh, then want to uh, switch over to uh, live coding, where I want to show you uh, recipe search that we did in Lecture 6 uh, in, in plain JavaScript, how we can refactor that to, to be um, available in Vue.js uh, in a component-based uh, framework. Um, let me just quickly... Okay. So if you do have any questions, uh, please interrupt, and uh, I will I will regularly look at the questions panel to answer your questions. So, so yeah, today what we're gonna look at mostly is uh, an overview of, of uh, the abstractions that support uh, us building declarative and reactive front-end applications. What both declarative and reactive means, we will hear in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, we will case study um, these. Uh, abstractions in Vue.js, which is uh, a pretty popular uh, framework. It's very similar to React and Angular, maybe a bit of a different philosophy behind them, maybe a bit of a different, you know, flavor, but essentially it's, they're very similar. And what I want to convey to you here is that, you know, all these frameworks change rapidly. You, you will have a different framework, you know, every year or every couple of years. But if you stick to those concepts, you will be familiarized with, with the way these frameworks usually work. So they might have a different name sometimes, but if you then read about a new framework, you say, oh yeah, right, this is about binding, and this is about components, and this is about encapsulation, right? So if you know about these um, underlying concepts and abstractions, I think it makes it much easier to pick up new frameworks, and new, new frameworks will come. Okay, there you go. So the learning goal, goal for today is, I want you to understand the interplay between uh, data and design and output, right? And how binding, this is the concept of, of creating a declarative connection between those two, uh, enables reactive uh, front ends. Reactive means that if you change something in the data, it automatically triggers a, a change in the output and design. Uh, I want you, um, when you, you're finished seeing this and you know also practicing this, to be able to design components uh, that properly encapsulate behavior, data, design, and output in, in a reusable fashion. And lastly, not just theoretically, I want you to, uh, to have the ability to map all of these concepts to be able to implement them, particularly in Vue.js, but hopefully also you can be, be able to pick up other frameworks like React or Angular very quickly. Okay, so let's start with a, a broad overview of the concepts, similar to what we did in the back end. Uh, there are less concepts here than there are in the back end that I think are important. I was struggling a little bit to design this particular slide and, and lecture in general because of how fast pacing uh, those web front-end frameworks are. And I hope we, we've gotten to a point that the abstractions make sense. How, uh, however, you know, take them with a grain of salt, always question them. Uh, this is something that I think will help you, but always be critical of these things too. So the goal of these abstractions are to enable declarative and reactive frontends. So uh, what does declarative mean? Declarative means that in, instead of specifying how you go into the DOM, the document object model, and changing things, you specify um, how the things that you want to change, the data, come in and are related to the output. That's the declarative part. The reactive part is that once these uh, connections have been established, um, you have the ability to change something in the data coming from a backend or coming from a user input, for instance, and uh, reactively uh, through following these connections, uh, change all these things, right? And, and, and this happens without you actually doing anything, without you having to tell the DOM, hey, I want to pick this element, I want to change something there, but you instead establish these connections beforehand declaratively and based on these connections, uh, the values just flow when they change. Uh, so I think that the central concept to all of this are something called components. And I think the 
the shape of a component, uh, if you want to think about it, is uh, by one encapsulation. You want to encapsulate particularly three different things. You want to encapsulate data, you want to encapsulate the style around the data, and you want to encapsulate some behavior. And what this enables us to do is it enables us to build reusable modules uh, that, that are then known by a name, right? So, and the other thing that is part of a component is this thing called data binding. And I talked about this just a second ago. What data binding essentially is, is it establishes a declarative notion of uh, component and model, and specifically the temp template and model. That's the next part. All of this is usually facilitated through uh, this concept of templates that we already heard about in packets. Okay. And within the templates, in the front-end frameworks, it's it's a, I would say, a, the difference here is that, that we have declared rendering. Okay, and to top this off, to make it obviously more complicated, uh, oftentimes this comes with uh, something called state management. Yeah? So let's say you have a, a component that you've built out of, out of your, um, out of your um, elements, right? Let's say, actually let's, let's open it up to, to the crowd a little bit. If you think of assignment two, right? You, um, we had the configurator, we had uh, the card with search. Uh, what do you think would be one component within that? Any ideas? Let's see if there are any hands up. Um, there's a hand up quickly, but now it's gone. Anyone? What what could be a component? Okay, so Daniel is a suggestion, the config component. Okay, um, so, so by config component, you probably mean the right size. Or where you have, we can we can add the sliders and everything, right? Um, Yulin has another session. The display of the configured art. Yes, perfect. So, so, so the so Daniel and Yulin had two suggestions. The, the one was uh, by Yulian the display of the configured art, and by Daniel the config component. And those are. Uh, two very different abstraction levels, and but they're both correct. They're both components. Um, the display of the configured R, of you know, one of the one of the displays, that's a very fine-grained component. I think that that's probably the lowest level of a component. However, the config component, if you look into it, has has probably different subcomponents. And that's something that you need to be aware of, that one higher level component can be composed of different sub-level components, right? So it's a, it's a compositional concept, in, in a sense. So you're, you're both correct. Those are both uh, good examples of components. Um, however, I would say that that the 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 display of the of the artwork is a, a lower level or or, or self-contained component, whereas the config component would be probably composed of you know the the frame width components and uh, the print size component and so on and so forth. Great. And last but not least, and it's, it's kind of in the in the back here, um, there's also routing in the front end. And this is specifically for the, um, a, a specific type of front end applications called single page applications. What single page applications are that instead of doing, excuse me, round trips between the server and the, the client where, where you get uh, different contents, you have this single page that does everything for you, right? So instead of, of of switching to a different to a different HTML or, or different you know backend at endpoint uh, for config and card and so and uh, so forth, you load the page once and all those different sub pages um, that are card and so on and so forth will be uh, dealt with within this one load, right? And what routing does uh, um, in all these frameworks, it helps you um, it helps you manage uh, things like the, the, the history, so the back and forward button, it uh, helps you establish a similar way to what you have in the back end. You have uh, URLs that can map to those pages within the single page application. Uh, we're going to mention it in the end a little bit. I think in A4, we're going to just, just give it to you and say, hey, here's how this looks like. 
because it's not super interesting now that you've already know about known about this uh, through the backends. Okay, so now that we know like a, a larger overview of what these components might be, let's dive deeper into them and, and see uh, how they can look like. Okay, um, before we move on to that, I want to maybe quickly just just uh, say a few words about the imperative versus declarative um, distinction here or dichotomy. So if you remember A2, everything that you did in A2 was imperative. Yeah. You need to create, create and maintain all the DOM elements um, and styles uh, yourself. So if you receive some data, then you have to, to um, as you receive the data, figure out how do I uh, insert certain elements into the DOM. Uh, and de depending on how you implemented that, the separation of concerns um, was, you know, maybe a bit difficult. And as the data changes, you need to, 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 um, to, to modify the DOM. And as the, use, the user inputs something, think of the frame configurator, you needed to update the DOM in different places, right? And you did so by, by handling events, and, and these events then imperatively change something on the site. Now, in the, in the declarative notion, and you know, I'm repeating myself, I know, but I think it's a very important aspect of, of this whole thing, the output is it represented declaratively within the concept of templates. And within those templates, we, we uh, declare bindings that um, establish relationships with the model output. And then the DOM, you have nothing to do with the DOM. The DOM is updated behind the scenes, so to speak, um, based on these relationships that you defined. Right? So, you, so there's no need to imperatively go in and manipulate the DOM. And, and, and this makes a lot of things much more elegant. So you will see as you will go through A4 that a lot of things that were tedious and, and time consuming and uh, you know sources of, of bugs and errors within A2 will just be a breeze in A4 because you have this declarative notion uh, baked in. Uh, let me see, was there a hand up somewhere? Why can I not scroll anymore? <laughs> Software is killing me. Nope, can't scroll. So if your hands are up, I can't see it. Uh, Daniel, do, do you want to say something? Let me open them. Okay, for, for some reason, oh yeah, there it is. So Daniel, is there a question? All right, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, perfect. So um, you said that, um, in the last slide with uh, the components that you also can put like print size and mat width and things like that uh, into separate components, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when I think of components uh, in Angular, for example, mm -hmm. I guess I wouldn't have put those into separate components. So my question is, how should the granularity be when it comes to components in general? Right. I, I think that's a, a perfect question. Um, so uh, how should the granularity be be thought of or, or designed for in, in any uh, front-end um, framework in general or, or any, any front-end design? And I think that's it's more of a, an art than a science, unfortunately. So there's no, I think no straight answer that then there might be um, certain heuristics you can use. A heuristic that, that, that you know, is very simple and you can use all over in a computer science. Uh, as you see duplication going on, then it, it might be uh, a chance to see abstraction. So uh, let's say um, frame width and mat width are very s similar things, right? Because they have a slider and they have an input, the slider and the input are connected to each other. Um, and then you can pass parameters or properties that uh, govern the min and max, for instance. Now, this seems like a natural, uh, let's say, uh, candidate for um, for a component. And I, I think it really depends on 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 the maintainability that that you that you want to achieve for your application. And also, th there's also a trade-off of over-engineering. So I've also seen people over-engineer and say, well, um, 
everything should be a component. And I, I agree with you that not everything should be a component. However, um, I think one of the heuristics is definitely duplication. Um, I think another heuristic is code organization. So maybe something should be its own component uh, because it encapsulates a certain behavior or data that is important to you. And you want to organize within that, that that's um, a, a separate, let's say, component. Uh, however, I, I don't have a definitive answer here. Uh, I think that all comes with practice and it also depends on the, the values and norms of the project. Um, not sure if that answers your question. Uh, yeah, it is kind of. And well, maybe uh, one thing. You also should um, take into consideration the, the front end, right? The, the HTML. What the what the user sees, and not only the logic when it comes to separating the different components, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So the so the the template and and the what the design and output is definitely a major part of of uh, what a component uh, is. So if you design a, what is a component, that's definitely part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So for, for some reason, this interface is just um, dying on me a little bit. So, uh, no, I was able to mute you. Great. Right. Okay. So, so went through imperative and declarative. And uh, there's one thing that you probably will encounter if you read about front end frameworks is this thing called MVVM. Uh, MVVM is, is sort of a successor or an evolution of model view controller that for certain things in front end frameworks, especially, seems sort of limited. And uh, it stands for model view, view model. So just quickly go through this and, and, and separate those things out. The model is the data that uh, in, in view, but in, also in other frameworks is represented as plain JavaScript objects. Um, then you have within the, this MVVM model, uh, you have uh, a complete separation between the, the template, the output, which is called the view, and the logic, which is uh, encapsulated in the view model. And now the view model handles the relationship between the view and the model, which, you know, not entirely true in view, for instance, because you, you have elements of the binding, uh, so this relationship in, in the view itself. But you could argue that, you know, it's it's kind of a, a, a joint component, a joint, let's say, place of the view. And as you update, Okay, the, the view is updated when properties of the model change, and the view model encap encapsulates all the methods that can modify the model. So, so you could think of it uh, as a sort of a, a class abstraction that you have in object-oriented programming. It's actually very similar if you think about it. Okay, and now just quickly recall backend templating. Um, you have template variables. You, you have uh, conditionals and loops, and through that, uh, you can do expansion, so you can even pass on data. It will expand the template variables and the conditional loops based on that data and will render an output. And in, th in this case, the backend that we looked at had this puck template. Now, the difference between backend and frontend templating uh, is, is pretty nuanced. It's, it's, not, it's not very different, but in a few places, I think it's important to, to realize the differences. Now, if you look at backend templates, uh, when the backend receives a, a request on an endpoint, it retrieves and, and computes some data, and then it either returns JSON, as you did in A3, for instance, in most cases, but it can also populate HTML files and uh, return, uh, sorry, populate templates, as I explained before, and re return generated HTML files. And, you know, those templates are static markup, um, and the variables that you see within those, those templates could be also seen as binding. However, if you look into the front-end templates, you, you maybe see a more uh, advanced use of these templates. They're conceptually very similar to, to the backends. You also have template variables, you have loops and conditionals usually. Um, however, the values that you see there are reactive, meaning that the model is, because you have a life cycle of using things in a template, on the backend you have request comes in, you do things, uh, a response. Right, you have this request response model. Whereas on the front end, people are continuously using your application. You're, you are in this continuous event loop where things can happen all the time. Meaning that if 
values in your model change, reactive means that the view changes also, right? And um, the other way around, model changes can be triggered by user input, and that's then called bidirectional uh, binding. But we'll we'll go uh, into that later. And the the nice thing about all that is that you you did. You define those things in logic, in declarative logic, and the DOM is updated for you. Right? So this is also uh, kind of the difference that we see here. All right. So moving into more practical things, uh, to look at these abstractions in a bit more detail, we're going to do a case study in Vue.js, meaning that uh, we're going to look at Vue.js, which is a, a fairly popular uh, front-end framework, I, I would say, that uses this MVVM model uh to build user interfaces and single page applications and i've only realized this uh you know a couple weeks ago uh there was a question by Bernard that i missed i apologize are there specific scenarios when you think uh, an imperative front end should be used um i think that, that's a really good question and th th that's actually uh, a disclaimer i should have put in front i think a lot of the things that we that we see within this, these front-end frameworks are certainly overkill for a lot of applications because they introduce another level of complexity that you need to maintain. Um, in the case of UGS, you can, that, that was my, my next thing I wanted to say, you can use it as a library, so that's a bit more low overhead. You can just have parts of your application be, be um, handled by, by Vue. Uh, however, uh, and that's, that's the next slide, you can use it as a fully fledged framework and everything is managed by you. You have uh, a build process behind it and stuff like that. So I think for a lot of applications uh, nowadays, people are jumping on this framework because they're cool uh, when what they actually need is just backend rendering. And if they need some interactivity uh, and, and the interactivity is contained enough and small enough, I think that's a, a very good case to say, we're just going to stick with imperative uh, front ends, where we just have a very limited set of interactive um, elements and interactive notion in our application. And the rest is actually request re response style, where the, the templates are rendered in the backend. And I feel like almost everyone should ask themselves, is my application uh, large enough to warrant the complexity of these front end frameworks? Right? So I, I think that's a consideration you have to make. And we shouldn't jump on the next cool big thing. Obviously, you know, we're all studying business informatics or computer science and we and software engineering. So we love tinkering with things. We love building those things. Uh, however, it's it's also a business decision um, as well as well as a technical one, actually, if you want to uh, encounter this complexity over and over, because yeah, then I also have to maintain those things. But yeah, again, this is more of a uh, an, an art versus science question. There's no, it's, it's difficult to kind of figure out uh, a definitive answer to this, but I hope it, it's sort of answered your question. Okay, but uh, if you look at, at the slide here, um, this is an example of, uh, you know, a hello world um, application of you. You have this uh, global variable called app, you instantiate a, a view instance, and in this U instance, uh, you have an, an L um, key that defines the, the component that you're going to replace with the output of U. You define a model with data, or actually, I probably, yeah, there you go. And then you have also have the template. And the nice thing about Vue as a library, you can already put the template in your, your markup, and then you will take care of the rest. So that, that's kind of nice actually. Um, and then when you see it down there, the app thing, that's a view model that keeps the view and the model in sync in the background, so to speak. Um, the model holds all our data. And then reactive, I'm just repeating here, just for the sake of re repeating because it's so important. Reactive means that changing course in this case would change the view automatically. There's nothing you need to do to say change the view for me. But that's that's a binding that that you already established by saying course um, on the top there. Now, if we move on to the next slide, if you want to use view as uh, you know 
more, let's say, uh, as a as a monolithic approach to to your to your application in the front end, then you can use it as a framework. And what what this enables you to do is um, you can have those things called .view files. And if you look to the right, that's an example of a view file. It contains the template, the behavior in the script tags, and then also the style that is specific to this component uh, within one file. And this is the way we're going to use view for A4. And there's a really, the nice thing about views also, uh, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the same or are similar for React and Angular because they're very popular frameworks, but they come with a lot of nice tools. So one of the tools that I'm going to show you later also is the view CLI. And the view CLI helps you with a lot of boilerplates and initial structure of the code. Okay, so let's dive right in to uh, a very top-down perspective of what a component is in Vue.js. So on the right side, uh, you have an example of a, a particular component, not all of it, just to fit for size, just the structure of it. And that's the component that uh, we will have in the live demo also. So uh, everything you, that you see in the slides, and uh, it's going to be just two files, the recipe item and recipe search that you, is something that is referenced uh, into the uh, recipe live coding a little later, and it's also already uh, online um, on GitHub in the same repository that we did for, for lecture six uh, on a different branch. So if you want, you can also follow along. So if you look at, at these components, components are supposed to be reusable building blocks. Okay. And part of that reusability or part of that that is encapsulating the, the, the HTML code as part of the template, that's the view. In there, we declare bindings to the internal model. Um, the templates support bounded loops and conditional rendering. And when we're done with the, the template part, we come to the behavior. The behavior is defined in the script where we say export default. And then there are certain elements of that object that, that we can fill. Uh, part of that is input parameters. So if, you have, if we have this uh, component, we may want to pass parameters into it. You can think of this as a constructor uh, um, of a class. So th this is defined in props. So you, on the right side here, you can see props. And in this case, props is expecting uh, a recipe object to be passed onto it. Okay. And in addition to this properties that come from outside, we can also define internal model um, um, model values, model data. So uh, there's a data um, object in, in there where we can say, what kind of data do we internally have in our states? So that's the, that's the internal state in the model. And then we have something called derived and compute values. Uh, just in a second, we're going to talk more about all this. Uh, we can register subcomponents. So if you, if you want to have a higher level component that ha has subcomponents, uh, then we would have to register this in the behavioral part in the script. And then we have functions that deal with event handling, or what can be called in, in other contexts too. Uh, so if something happens within your temp template of the component, you can specify which functions uh, uh, has to be called that is in the scope of this component. And um, last but not least, we have these things called lifecycle methods uh, because the way that the view works and other front-end framework works, there's a lifecycle to things happening. So uh, in particular, we're going to look at two lifecycle um, uh, hooks, namely mounted and created, uh, that, that will tell us uh, at what stage of the lifecycle we are, and we can, be, we can respond to that. So we can have an event listener that responds to that lifecycle event. And last but not least, but uh, that's something that probably not, not that important, I would say, but it's, it's still part of the, the whole framework, is that you can encapsulate a uh, style that is scoped just to that component. So that, let's say you have an uh, li component, a list component, uh, sorry, a list element in, within your template, and you want to style it in some way. You can just say li, and it will style uh, just that component. So it will be scoped in that area if you tell it to the script, obviously. So let me see if there. Oh, there are questions. Huh? Um, so Jay has a question. That says, what is a single page application again? So a single page application is kind of the panda to, to um, applications that have multiple pages, meaning that 
let's say in A2, we had cart.html, we had uh, config.html, and so on and so forth. Those are multiple pages where if you click the, uh, on a page, it will, it will open this new page for you, okay? Single page application refers to a mode of application where you load just one big thing in, into your front end, and then the front end handles uh, switching between different pages. And those pages in this case are components. So say in the case of, of um, A4, you would have a single page application coming down, which has you know the header and has uh, the search in the beginning. But if I click uh, on one of the items when I search, it will not go to uh, config.html. What it will do is it will, the, the routes that we have established will say, well, load this component that you have already downloaded. Load this component, uh, config, and, and it, it will do so um, just on the front end. There will be no requests and, uh, and response that will change the page. Okay, and the other question by Julian, does UGS support type JavaScript as Angular does uh, with TypeScript using classes and in interfaces? Um, um, I'm pretty sure it does because uh, if, if you use if you use uh, um, this transpiled version of, of Vue because uh, it's a node-based build process. So I'm pretty sure you can because uh, within this node-based build process, you can say TypeScript and will transpile to JavaScript also. Um, there might be some interaction between the two, but I, I'd be surprised if they haven't figured that out. Uh, if the next question is, will we support um, TypeScript for A4? Um, I would say no for now, but I will talk, I will talk to this internally because it seems like a, a, a very emotional point for people. They want to use TypeScript. Although I think for the size of the applications we have, I mean, we're fine, but that's different. I don't want to start any, any, any wars here. Okay, so if we move on to probably the most important thing in, in the slide deck, binding. And I've talked about binding before. You probably heard about the concept of binding before. What does binding actually do? Well, it declares relationships from uh, the output, the template, to the internal model and, and to properties. And it does so uh, with its interpolation syntax. Uh, you say uh, curly bracket, curly bracket, then you have an expression. Uh, and that expression can, can contain multiple um, multiple elements of the model, all the properties. However, in most cases, it's just the, the direct binding, meaning that it's the direct relationship between model and output. Uh, if you want to, so th this is the uh, syntax to use if you want to bind to um, to the content of the DOM element. If you want to bind to a, a tag. Uh, of an element, you do, uh, as you see in the second example here, you would say v dash bind. This is called the directive. Uh, if you've yet used Angular before, you've seen the directives before. Uh, these are just uh, prefixes um, to uh, to attributes in HTML that tell the framework what to do. Right? It's very simple. And you can either use v bind, and then standard image would be called from uh, the data you see on the right side. Right, it would just call the standard a, a, a JPEG, or uh, a shorthand for, for because it's used so often in uh, UGS, and that's just syntactic sugar. It's just saying colon src that the the contents of, of this will be bound. And now uh, I talked about one way and two way before. Uh, one way refers to the direction of data flow. So in in the one way case, the values from the model and properties are bound to the template that create the output. Right, that is then expanded. However, it is not the other way around. The other way around is two-way binding, meaning that the binding goes uh, from and to the internal model, and that works if you have uh, inputs. If you can actually interact with the element and can change certain things. So that means that that the model changes are reflected in the view, but the changes in the view are also reflected in the model, right? And the way you, you do this in, in uh, UGS is, is with this property called v-model. And what this does is, it if you have the input here, um, in this case, I use ingredient inputs from, from the recipe search, uh, then everything that you, that you store in the model will be present in the view. But as you change something, as you type something into this input field, it will automatically trigger a change in the model. It will be reflected. So this is not 
possible for properties for uh, a very important reason. If you would have direct binding uh, to the parents, because the properties are objects that are passed down uh, from the parent to the child component, right? If I can just uh, propagate this up without any, any uh, specific event handling, for instance, or some shared state, then this will cause a lot of maintainability issues, right? So you cannot bind bidirectionally to properties, you can bind bidirectionally to internal model data. Okay. And now we have computer properties. Now, computer properties are, are, are interesting uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, the, the reason they're used or, or they have been designed by the framework designers is, and, and computer properties are, are not just a view thing, computer properties are, for instance, uh, are also used in Swift, which is the uh, is used in uh, an iOS. And the inline expressions that we have within the templates should be limited to very simple operations, maybe one boolean, maybe a concatenation. But if you have something that is a bit more complex or that uh, accesses internal data structures that, that should be uh, encapsulated also from the template, um, then you should use something called computer properties. And computer properties are declarative values that have more complex logic that are dependent on the internal model values. So there's a, there's a, a linear relationship usually between uh, the computer property and the model value. So they're declared as named functions and in the template they act as data. So in the template you, you can just say if you look at the right side of the example I have this um, ingredient count in the template and ingredient count is a computer property that is derived from uh, the ingredients that, that I have in the recipe, right? Uh, and I actually see a typo here. This should be this uh, dot re recipe dot ingredients. So, sorry about the typo here. Um, so, yeah, so, so the, the property can be bound to the template. If you want to have two-way binding though, so if you look at here, this is how you, you do the binding. If you want to do two-way binding, you need a getter and a setter. In the one-way binding case, uh, it's okay to just uh, have the function because you only have the getter. However, if you want to do two-way binding, you need a getter and a setter. And here's an example from the recipe search, right? And the thing with computer properties is they have to be deterministic and synchronous, right? Because they're just they're just um, um, a view, a different view of an already internal property. So in the in the case of my ingredient count is just an abstraction or a view or a, that has a linear relationship with the underlying model. In this case, the ingredients. Um, there are other things that you can do with computer properties. Um, in the case that I have in recipe search, I just change representation. I change it from you know a comma separated string to uh, an array uh, and the other way around, for instance. Right? Uh, these operations have to be deterministic because, and that's the next part, uh, the properties are cached meaning that they're only recomputed when the underlying model value changes. Yeah, and that's, that's part of the reactive framework. If you wanna have a functionality that is uh, asynchronous and functionality that, that is um, non-deterministic, so it depends on some random factor, depends on the current day, depends on something that, that you know, isn't pure, then you can use just regular methods or regular functions that are inherent in, into the component, right? So you have those two things. You have computer properties and you have functions. Uh, conditional rendering, um, I, I would say that's not something that uh, should be any surprise. If you uh, wanna show certain things only when a condition applies or a, con a condition evaluates to true, then you use uh, the, the directives be if, be else, uh, be el uh, else if. Uh, here's an example from the recipe item uh, component on the right side. Uh, you can use them on tags. So if I say img the if, then if recipe to thumbnail in this case is not true, doesn't exist, uh, then it will remove the, the img tag from the DOM. And if I have multiple things that, that, uh, that I want to only show when something or, or want to have in the DOM when uh, it's true, then I use a template. So I can use a template as a, as a child of another template. So in this case, I say template, I say v if on recipe URL, and then I, sh I show this whole thing only if a URL exists. 
And uh, j just a, a quick aside, uh, there's also something called vshow, and you might, might ask yourself, well, what's the difference? The difference is that uh, vif, vls, and vls if uh, actually remove the element from the DOM, and vshow just just uh, sets the display on the CSS to none. That's a that's a difference. Okay. Then we have uh, bounded loops, or they're sometimes called list rendering because that's what they do. They they map elements of of an array or or actually of the keys of an object, if you want to use an object, to HTML elements. So uh, the syntax is we have a tag that you want to repeat multiple times based on the, the, the contents of an, of an array, for instance. Then you say v4 uh, in that tag. And you can you can actually also use uh, JavaScript syntax and, and say, uh, in this case, ingredient of recipe ingredients. But you can also say ingredient in recipe ingredients. So both those things work. And then you sort of loop over, or you map actually to this HTML element. And within this element, that you can then use, um, you can then use the object as you want. So in this case, ingredient is just is just a string, so I, I can use anything. But if uh, if you do this for uh, if you loop over the recipes, then you can you can use the recipe object and access them. The thing is that you will need uh, to bind the key. The key has to be unique. In older versions of Vue, that was optional because it's just there for performance reasons, basically. However, in um, in the new uh, newer linters like that ship with Vue, uh, it's mandatory. So that this is something that I had to learn for myself uh, when developing Vue again. Um, if you just don't have uh, a, a key that is unique, in the case of the recipes that we get from Recipe Puppy, there is no ID, right? So what you can do is uh, you can have the iterator, if you look down there, say item and index, right? And then you can get the, the index of the array, and that can be your key. And you know that, that's that's fine, and it, it works with you. It uh, doesn't really help you with the performance issues in, in the background, but if they want to have a, a, a key, they'll, they'll get a key. OK, now we come to events and methods, which are, are interesting. So I mentioned before, if you have asynchronous and non-deterministic things to do, then you use methods. Now, methods usually are used in conjunction with, with events. And events are very similar to the events you know from, from plain old JavaScript. Uh, you have DOM events that uh, you can register a callback for, an event listener. And the event listener can either be an inline expression that you have in the template, or it can just call uh, a function that you define in this methods um, in this methods key. So if you look at at the uh, right example here, we have methods where we have recipe search. Recipe search is an uh, asynchronous function, and it, it gets triggered if you look to the right side. Um, when oh yeah, it's, when we when we have an event. So, so now events in view are the syntax is a bit different. The syntax for events in view is a v dash on colon, and then you have different events. Um, uh, identifiers, and you can look at the view website and their cheat sheets to to show you all this. Uh, the shorthand for this is just at, and then the uh, event identifier. In this case, click. Um, now, if you look at the example here, this here we do a v on submit, and then we have this other thing that that is dot prevent. Uh, these are called event modifiers, and th those are uh, post fixes in directives that capture common functionality. Right, so preventing the, the default behavior on a form is very common in single page applications. So, and they have this for different events. Things that are very common can be uh, specified in this directive, uh, and it, it saves you uh, asking for preventing default in the method. And the reasoning that the framework developers give for this is that it makes the logic that you have in these event listers more pure. Now we come to custom events. So um, custom events are a sort of important, um, especially in A4, but I think in general in components, because a lot of times you're encapsulating something that that uh, might be important for the outside world within your component. And if something changes with the internal state, for instance, you want to emit this information. And this is how uh, exactly how this these custom components work. Um, custom events ca can be emitted by saying this, and then dollar emit, and then the name of that um, of of that event. 
the event listener has to then be registered in the in the component that you you are instantiating in the parent. So in the parent, in this case, I say recipe item, uh, and then I say v on, which is you know the event handler ingredient add, and then I call the function add ingredient search. And on the right side, we see an example of this in in the recipe item component. I say well if we click on one of the uh, ingredients, then call this function add ingredient that we have. And all this function does is just pass up this event ingredient add with the particular ingredient that we have. And then the parent component knows what to do. The parent component can, can then do whatever you, uh, you want. In the particular example that we have, what we'll do is uh, we will add the, the, the ingredient to the search bar. Right, and this is this is how this looks like. Okay, so now we come to the the lifecycle hooks. So lifecycle hooks, as I said before, have to do with um, how Vue builds up and renders and does all these things uh, with these components. Uh, this is not something that you need to, to to know. You don't need to know the whole lifecycle. It's it's mostly something that you look up when you need it. So disclaimer on the bottom here. Don't learn this whole thing for the test. However, two very common uh, lifecycle hooks that I think are important also for A4 are the mounted hook and the created hook. So the mounted hook seems to be the, the most commonly used hook. It's uh, it's basically uh, uh, a, not a synonym, but it's, it's the same thing as the, the DOM content loaded events that we use for A2, for instance, and JavaScript in general. So it's called after the DOM has been fully rendered. However, just beware. It's not the exact same thing as DOM content loaded because there's no guarantee that all child components that you have have also already been rendered. Okay, so be aware of that. If you want that to happen, there's a uh, an internal internal mode that I think it's called uh, this dot dollar ticks. So have a look at that if you're interested. But what you have um, is you have the ability to to access the templates, the reactive components, uh, and manipulate all of the the elements in the DOM that are directly in the high level of the template. You see. Now the, the difference in the created hook is that the DOM itself has not been loaded yet. But all the options in the components, so all the parameters and behavior are available. So you have all the data, you have all the computer properties, you have all the methods, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And the, usually what you use the created hook for is to trigger um, fetching data from, from backends, for instance. Uh, you might ask, well, I could do that in mounted too. That's true. However, um, because the DOM is already loaded with the mounted, uh, the content will be visible with the standard model that you have internally. So let's say you have a, a model for artworks and you have some standard model in there uh, with basic data, maybe empty data even, then maybe just for a split second or if the performance of the, of the applications is a bit more, is a bit slower, uh, you will have uh, the client or the user seeing this, this empty thing before the actual data comes in. I mean, if you, if you load the things you created, then you have, will have the data immediately shown in the template. Okay. Now, state management. Okay, uh, there's a question with Daniel. Can you use something like emit with sibling components? No, unfortunately not. So if you are if you have sibling components, and that's, that's perfect timing, because that's something where, where uh, sort of global state management comes in more handy. If you want to... If you want to manage to send something over to sibling components, you either have to emit something to the parent and the parent passes it down to the sibling, right? And that's a, a common illness of, of all these uh, tree structured um, uh, tree structured models, right? It's very hard to communicate to the, to the sibling. However, if you, if you do need to communicate more globally what your state is, then state management comes into play. So state management is, is about managing shared global state or shared global me me memory, uh, if you want, in a principled manner. And Vuex is, is one of the libraries that does that. It introduces abstractions to create a life cycle that we see on the right side here, um, to dealing with, with reactive global state. And, and I would say, and I will caution you again, do not use the state management libraries if you don't need to. If you can avoid global states, not only in front ends, anywhere. If you can avoid global state, avoid global state, because global state 
is is just a parameter that comes out of nowhere, right? That anyone can change in any way. It's very hard to reason about. And because it's so hard to reason about, uh, people in in all the front end framework camps have thought about how to how to make this better. And the way to make this better is to to uh, make changing the state uh, very principled. And this is what we see on the right here. We have um, there's no direct way to access the state. If you want to access the state, you can only do so uh, by two abstractions. The two abstractions are committing mutations. So, if you want, the committing mutations is, is a synchronous um, function that is called on the state to change the state. Okay, so it's a deterministic way of saying in this example, and this is an example that, that comes up in all the tutorials. You can implement the counter. You have some counter, let's say you have a card, the card counter up there, right? Or you have a card. And um, you say, I want to commit this mutation increment. And increment in, in this case is, is a predefined function on the state. Yeah. So if you look at the, at the tutorial from Vue uh, about uh, Vuex, then you will see that for everything you want to do with this global state that is then populated to all the components that want to use it, uh, you have to be uh, very um, rigorous. You have to say what what do you? It's, it's a bit of like a like a police state. What do you want to do with the state? How are you going to change it? How are you going to access it? And so on. And the thing is, from your components, you cannot even call mutations directly. You have to call something called actions. And actions are, are functions that then commit one or many mutations. And actions then can be asynchronous. Uh, and they can be asynchronous because sometimes you want to uh, you, you want to sync your state with the backend. Yeah? You will see this as an, as an example in A4 because the shopping cart that we'll have in A4 will also have state on the backend. And this makes things tricky, right? Because you don't only have to maintain something that, that is in the front end that is you know, complicated global state, but also something that is on the backend. So actions enable you to do that and then add limitations. If you want to use these actions and components, you have to dispatch them. So in this case, Here's an example. You say this that's a dollar store. That's the, the global um, state, and you say dispatch, and then you call the action that is also predefined. Yeah. And the nice thing about all this is that the mutations are tracked. So if you come into a situation where you don't know where a mutation comes from, and you don't know uh, who emitted it, and and how it worked through the life cycle of the um, of the usage of the application this logging of all these things makes it easier to debug and to reason about and and this is why uh these frameworks are so complicated because dealing with state and, and understanding how state changes over different components because it's global it's just very difficult and again uh, i want to caution you all these libraries for reactive state management i think in react is called redux uh, can be overkill for scholar applications if it's possible for you encapsulate your state uh, locally and emit events, for instance. Uh, you can also, um, and I'll show you this to you in a second, uh, have those events uh, be bidirectional. So, so th th there's some way of, of making this a bit nicer, um, but there's certainly trade-offs of using such a, a complex approach to state management. Um, in A4, we, we will use Redux just to show you um, how it works and ju just so you see how this workflow happens. Okay. Last but not least, routing. So routing will give you a, a, a process-like navigation behavior for single-page single applications. So if you have multiple components that you know you can call pages sometimes, um, it will simulate the standard navigation. So it will have browser history in there. It will show user fragments that will look like routes. So here's an example. You will have. Um, it's always behind the the you know the the hashtag or pound sign, whatever you want to call it. Uh, because that's the thing that the client can actually control, right? Because that's not part of the of the backend. The everything that comes after the the frag the hash or, or the pound sign is the fragment that is controlled by the front end. And this is what the route ma maps to. And if you look at the view library, it's very similar to what we've seen uh, in the backend. You define a path, and this path can have parameters. And if it has parameters, if you look at the second to the last uh, example here, you can pass this parameter as a property to the components. And this is how you can control uh, the routing. 
Okay, and this is the last slide. Um, what I hopefully was able to convey to you is that there are an endless variety of front-end frameworks, but the underlying concepts and abstractions uh, are very similar. And hopefully by uh, making yourself aware that, that these concepts are similar through the evolution of, of these frameworks and, and, and time, uh, you will see that um, the, the same concepts will pop up. They will have maybe slightly different names and maybe a bit different philosophies of, of how of how the, these frameworks work, but essentially the, they're pretty much the same. So with that, I want to close the theory part and then maybe move over to uh, the live demonstration.